right, I think we're on. So thank you everybody uh, for joining today. Uh, from wherever you are, I just saw in the chat, hello from Miami. So hi from Miami. So wherever you are in the world, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, and I hope you're all safe and well. Uh, so thank you again for joining our second Creative Speaker Series event. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the introduction music. Uh, I certainly was. Uh, my name is Alistair Simpson. I'm the VP of Design uh, here at Dropbox. And we've got a wonderful lineup curated for this series coming over the coming, coming year. Uh, so please keep, keep joining uh, for these events. And uh, firstly, though, uh, a huge thank you to the Dropbox Design Ops team. Uh, who've worked incredibly hard to curate this series with some amazing speakers. And I'm really excited for the lineup uh, that we've got. Now, in our last event, we had, or our first event, I guess it was our, it was our first event, we had Eric Rice uh, from Patagonia, uh, the wonderful um, outdoor brand. And today we're privileged to have the talented Benjamin Pardo from one of certainly my favorite furniture brands, uh, Knoll, joining us to talk about craft, innovation, and doing what you love. And so, I'm really excited for him to share some stories around craft with us today. Um, but just to frame, I guess, the series, you know, we're, we're talking about craft. Craft takes time. Mastery takes time. Uh, you have to hone that craft over many, many years. And you can't just take a, a single you know, year course and then think that that's everything you need to know. And so we, we can often lose that, I think, in modern move fast kind of society. And so, in this first design speaker series, we're exploring the stories of heritage brands. Hence, we've had Patagonia and now we've got Knoll. And as I mentioned today, we've got Benjamin Pardo, who's Senior Vice President and Design Director, uh, at, at senior, uh, design director at Knoll, and he's responsible for product and showroom design worldwide. And so Benjamin joined Knoll in 2005, so he's been there over 15 years. He, where he, and previously, he'd spent 17 years with Unifor where he served as president and developed strategies and programs to enhance the company's success with the design community in North America. And so Benjamin earned a BA from Vassar College and an MA in literature from the University of Bologna. Now, last time round with Eric, uh, we had a Q&A format, but when Benjamin and I met a few weeks ago, I was fascinated by his insights into the differences between art, design, craft, as well as how Knoll, a heritage brand who'd been building products since 1938, had evolved its home and office designs, and especially relevant during this work from home period. And so today, I'm going to hand over to Benjamin now. We've got Benjamin giving us a, a short presentation, probably 20 or 30 minutes, and then we're going to move to Q&A, so a slightly different format today. And so with that, I'm going to hand over to, to the wonderful Benjamin and let him take the stage. And... Uh, Thank you for joining us, Benjamin. We appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you guys that have joined us this afternoon, evening, or morning, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Benjamin Pardo, obviously, as I've been introduced. And I'm excited to have a conversation with you today. And Alistair has sent me up to answer a bunch of questions, I think. Um, and I guess one of the first things that I want to start out with is um, there are two parts to it, I guess. One is, is that Knoll is an 80-year-old company, um, and it was founded by um, a man and a woman um, who were very much tied to design in a lot of ways. Um, and, but I guess we have to start to understand from a Knoll perspective and from my perspective, really, can we define what design is, um, especially from a guy who sits in a chair that uh, works with spaces and furniture and so on and so forth? And I want to put it in the context of two other terms, which is craft, which is a term that Alistair used, and art, okay? So you're all very imaginative people. I want to put images in your head rather than show them to you because then you can take the fantasy associated with the thought where you want it. So the first thing that I want you to see is an African stool that's a hand-carved object out of a log that someone sits on. So that's number one. Number two is a Brancusi sculpture, which is a carved or cut object made of wood and a series of stacked shapes that is art that was done by Brancusi. 
The third one is that Charles Eames, um, in the 50s on a post-war basis, did a series of stools that were called chess pieces. And they basically had a series of shapes that looked like different kinds of pawns um, that you use in the chess game. Um, and if you think about these three objects in the context of what they are physically, right? They're all wood, they're all stacked geometric shapes. And with some Brancusis are bigger, but there's also a scale question. But from my perspective, they're three very different things, right? So the first one we talked about was a, an African stool. It's craft, okay? So a craftsman who knows how to work with wood cuts something so that it is functional. And he or she does it in such a way that it has an aesthetic, but it's done in a crafted way, right? Two was the Brancusi sculpture. This is an artist. This is someone who is taking an intellectual idea, right? And embodying that in a sculptural form. So it's not at all crafted, really. And it's not in any way, shape or form, from my perspective, design, right? Three, the Eames stool. This is a turned object. It's manufactured. It has a coating on it in such a way that it is resilient for people to sit on. It's manufactured for a specific cost and a target. And the other thing that it's manufactured for is the capability to make many, 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 many of them. So the idea of design for me is a problem associated with just that. These three things are identical intellectually, but they're all quite different. One has the hand, you physically see in the stool, the movement of the wood. One has the saw marks and no finish. And one is about an, ob an object that becomes ubiquitous in your home or in your office or in a place that you want to sit as something that's part of your personality and um, the way in which you work. So having defined all of that um, and the way in which I look at the world associated with those three things, and one of them is not better than the other. And I'm not saying that Noel does not do things that are sometimes craft-based. We're clearly not artists. But the, uh, the real question is, is that what's the foundation of the company in any real sense? And who was Florence Knoll and who was Hans Knoll and what did they do? And what does that really mean for me as I move the company forward and the people who have worn um, the, the coat that I wear currently that'll be passed on to the next individual? So we, we mentioned a guy by the name of Eames and I'll, I'll very quickly tell a story that I can pick two guys by the names of Eames and Saren and were involved in a competition for the Museum of Modern Art to design furniture on a post-war basis. And they won with an organically based chair that was made out of plywood. And plywood was a technological, incredible kind of thing um, that, and we all know about the Eames splints and so on and so forth. But I think that that relationship starts to divide very quickly if we look at two companies, Herman Miller and Knoll, which are from my perspective, the two most important office-based companies associated with modern design. Um, and, but they're quite different. Eames was a product designer, right? So everything that we look at that's Eames-based is very much an object that expresses itself in space. And when you walk into a room, you see it, you don't see the room, okay? Saarinen and Florence Knoll did something very, very different. If you think about Florence and all furniture, she ba basically built rectangles all the time. Um, she built sofas, credenzas, and what did she intend with them? She intended to create sub-architectural spaces and an overall space to break things down. And then she worked with people like uh, Saarinen and Bertoia, and the litany goes on, to make sculptural form-based pieces, right? Um, that sort of represent the figure, the idea of background foreground. Um, so, the real question became one of, <coughs> what does that mean? How does that balance? How does that balance with an Eamesian logic versus a Saren and Florence Knoll logic? And at the end of the day, you need both of these things in an interior, but historically it really sets the precedent in terms of who we are. And I put that in the context of what it is that I believe that both craft and design are. So what's my responsibility as we move forward associated with designing products, working through spaces, um, and understanding what it is that the problem question or what it is that we're solving, because design is nothing more than a problem solving mechanism. Um, and I think that all of us, audience included, and we'll talk later a little bit about how we do things that are quite similar sometimes. But I guess the, the, the important question is, is that 
what is the responsibility of the person, man or woman in my role, to be true to the original brand? And I think that that's absolutely paramount to what it is that we do. Um, I think that all the products that we work on, whether they be systems-based products that go into offices, whether they be uh, residential-based products, whether they be textiles, whether they be architectural products, um, whether they, in some cases, even if they come from companies that we own like Muto and so on and so forth, the real question is, is the integrity of what that thing is needs to maintain the heritage and continue to do that. So let's use a couple of examples. I'm gonna use three um, because we work with different, one of the things that's really important to understand is that I am not a designer and I don't really design anything for an all, right? My job is to be an editor, number one, and to convince two dimensional people to spend a lot of money on three dimensional objects. <laughs> so with that criteria, and understanding that if I'm an editor and a facilitator, one of the things that I get to do is decide who we work with um, in order to design specific kinds of products because we have no internal in-house designers. We only work with people outside. So, and we need different kinds of designers to do different kinds of products or projects or communications and so on and so forth. So the, we have worked with a series of star architects um, that go back to Saarinen himself and Frank Gehry, and um, I myself have worked with people like Ram Koolhaas and David Adjit. So let's talk about those experiences for a second in contrast to a number of projects that I've done with industrial designers who do more systems-based like product, company by the name of Antenna. I chose them because they don't design furniture. They had not designed furniture. They designed the New York City subway cars physically. Um, and are, did a lot of the interface work associated with that, also for Bloomberg. So let's compare and contrast those two types of designers. Um, REM was a very interesting project because it was an intellectual idea that we wanted to explore. Um, and in some ways I went into it understanding that uh, this product probably was not intended to sell hundreds of millions of dollars of what that one thing is but was very much about the image and the association and the byproduct and the process of what it is that the design itself was. And there were a series of objects and I think that the most, the most recognized object was a very interesting thing called a counter. And what the counter was, was a series of rectangles that were literally stacked one on top of the other like my pens and pencils. And what they did when they were stacked like this is that they were a wall. So they divided space and they divided people because remember, we create these spaces for people in creating interaction between them. But the amazing thing that they did was that they had the opportunity for rotation and extension, right? And what they went from is they went from a wall to becoming the central piazza. So if you're in an Italian city and you finish lunch, and you do something called La Passaggiata afterwards to go for a walk, you go into the center of town and you have coffee and you exchange information. And this object was transformed architecturally, quite literally, from a wall to a gathering point. Why was this important to me? Because basically this was a lot of information and research about how people come together, which is something that we study a lot in home. Um, both in terms of how they live at home, in the office, and places in between, hospitality, so on and so forth. So things like that project um, inform projects that we do with uh, a group by the name of Antenna, Masamichi Uragao and Ziggy Moslinger, who are two designers that I told you do these incredible industrial objects and a lot of interface work. So, but what it informs is the question of how do you create a space or an object that is a facilitator for people to do what it is that they do. And what do we do in the office? Let's cover that one first. We exchange information, right? And there's a great, the parallel that I'll make between what you do and what I do is that I do the physical and you do the ethereal of allowing people to provide each other with information in order to work together, right? That's the exchange that takes place. That's our commonality. We solve that one problem together. 
but we need to have the examples to help build on in order to understand how you make a product that Antenna has worked on for the past 10 years that the product line keeps on growing, which is a manufactured object, which is a $130 million a year based product line, right, volume, which is what I was talking about, but all designed in a very clean way. And to me, has a very direct relationship back to the work that we did with them. There's another type of work that we do at Knoll, um, and that work is associated with products that I work with sometimes interior designers with. So someone like Jared Derso, um, one of the fathers of high tech, along with uh, of Ward Bennett. So Joe comes to the fray with an understanding of what happens on a residential basis and what people need, right? And so what does Noel do, right? I just talked to you about three different ways in which designers do something. Well, if we don't have a lot of designers, right? We don't have any of those. We have a whole hell of a lot of engineers. And we have a very great understanding of the question of materiality, how to push materiality and change things. Because the design of furniture in no matter where you put it is really nothing more than an historic evaluation of materiality. So we start with Breuer, right? Bicycles, bent tubes, any of you that went to a psychiatrist sometimes in 1960 sat in a Vosily chair, okay? <laughs> Which is that square-based chair. Um, so tubular based on bicycles. Um, then you move on and possibly e even a little bit before that was someone like Alto who dealt with the question of how do I bend wood, right? Um, then you deal with someone like Eames and Sarian. How do I really bend wood? in a three-dimensional way, not just a tubular angle, but I'm moving on the X, Y, and Z axis. Then there's the question of lightweight metals and fibers and the introductions of plastics and all of these questions. So as you look at furniture componentry, we are nothing more than a history of what that is. So what's so exciting to me is that when I look back to all the people that, that have held this position, including Florence Knoll, if you think of a sarin and uh, shell chair, which is made, was originally made out of fiberglass, do you know where we made it? We made that in a factory that was founded in war during World War II that made small fiberglass boats for the war effort, the hulls. And we needed the complexity of that capability in order to make the seat shell. Florence Knoll went to them and said, I want to make a chair. These people, had the breadth of knowledge to understand a design vision of Saarinen and Florence Knoll. When I worked with a company by the name of Formway, we worked with a plastic material or a polymer material by the name of Hytrel. And Hytrel was a material that was experimented with in the 70s because it did something very, very interesting. It has a great memory and it stretches. Um, and it is very resilient to being caustic. So it put in places like the hinges of dishwashers or on the bumpers and on the cushions associated with smooth ride for trucks. We took that material because, it, and because plastics are expensive and utilized the concept of being able to, make, to mold something small, stretch it so it's bigger, minimization of material usage, it also had the capability to have a lot of green components based on agricultural plastics that were renewable and make a chair that literally had a live back. So going from the back of fiberglass to going to using the materiality of what it is that was done with this particular polymer, we're basically doing the same thing all the time. But we do work in some very traditional ways as well. And I can give you an example, which is one of, it's actually one of my favorite projects. It was a project with David Ajay, the, uh, uh, the Brit, he's actually from uh, North Africa, but he's lived between New York and the UK. And we did a table that started out to be a plastic table and it didn't quite work out because we couldn't mold it. When we mold things, uh, you need to be able to have a draft so that when you open the mold, the part will come out. And what we were designing was having a lot of problems with that. So we modified it, but the costs were still too high. So what we did was we decided to work with bronze and went to one of the last two bell casters, meaning bells for churches, that make bronze bells and made this table. 
This is a very crafted table. Uh, we made it, we indicated that there would be an addition of only 100. I think that we've probably sold about 65 of them. It's not an inexpensive table, but it's absolutely beautiful. And it implies and had a direct relationship to his museum in Washington, DC um, on black history. And um, so these are the kinds of things that we get involved in on a regular basis in addition to traditional things like upholstery and caning and so on and so forth. So the, the real question of what we think about and the problems that we solve are related to those objects. But I guess the real question is how do we get to the object um, and how do we define problems and what's the process? And I guess that's the most important part of what it is that we do because we come to the question of what is the issue that we need to solve for? what is the litany of ways in which we can potentially solve for something? And then we throw that back at the engineers, the marketing team, the designers, um, the sales team also, because there's an enormous amount of collaboration between all of these groups because it's a business in terms of what it is that we're doing. And um, design plays a very vital role. And I think the thing that I, one of the things that I enjoy a great deal about what it is that I do is the fact that there's the capability to facilitate and work through the organization. So my responsibility is to sit down and have a conversation with people that make machines that make furniture, to sit down with the likes of Starchitect A, B, or C and ask them if they wanna work with us, or to talk to the press or to talk to you about what it is that we do. And and I, the other great thing that I get to do is that I get to walk through the entire organization at all in terms of how objects impact them and what their requirements are and how we move those various kinds of things through our system. Um, and I guess the, one of the things that I did study um, that served me, even though my father couldn't understand why this is that I was studying what I was studying, is that I studied the, uh, idea of semiotics with a guy by the name of Umberto Eco when I was at the University of Bologna in the 80s. And the question of syntax and the question of how the science of semiotics and what that implies is very much related to what it is that I do on a daily basis in terms of deciphering language, right? <laughs> because people, if people are going to help you define a problem, you need to understand what it is that they're telling you. And you need to have a commonality in understanding, because this is probably the first problem that we have to solve, and that is communication. And what is the information that's being exchanged in terms of what it is that we do and we don't do, and uh, so on and so forth, and those various, the, the various points associated with that. So we talked a bit about office, but I think that one of the things that becomes important to also understand is that Knoll is not just an office-based company, we also make residential products. And when Florence Knoll founded the company, the, the proportion or relationship was about 60% projects that were related to the office and 40% residential. And interestingly enough, through the 80s and so on and so forth, we went up to 90% office and very little residential. And right now we're at a point associated with the fact that we're probably back to that 60-40 balance and possibly even a little bit more on the residential side. I think that that's a really important thing, even on a pre-COVIDian basis, and really, really important on a post-COVIDian basis, because these two things really inform each other. Um, the way in which people are currently living and working, um, notwithstanding the current situation that we have with the virus, is in some ways interchangeable. And this thing um, facilitates the fact that I can lead my life and I won't call it work. I'll just call it leading my life anywhere. And we come back to the, um, the question of exchange of information um, or exchange of ideas. And I don't necessarily have to be tied to something very, very specific. Um, and I don't know that this is the first time that design has actually been a very important a pioneer in helping us get there, right? I look to, and in many cases, tech companies, and the examples that I'll give you are tech companies. I look at companies like Olivetti, right? Olivetti was making these amazing objects that 
helped people understand how to use them, right? The idea of product semantics is something that's very important in terms of a lot of Sotsas's work and Bellini's work. And then Watson from IBM spent a lot of time looking at them. And IBM had one of the most incredible design departments in terms of Richard Sapper's work and the graphic work and so on and so forth. They created a, a huge corporation, which is very different today than it was previously, but led to, by design. And then the intellectual questions, if we look at another tech company, which is something that you guys build yourselves on, um, and excuse me if I'm showing my age, look at the research associated with Xerox PARC. Xerox PARC did such an amazing thing to me that made the bank machine or the teller machine or the ATM work. Xerox PARC, through part of the design process, converted the concept of the noun to the verb so that action physically took place on a screen in terms of that information that made the whole process so much more understandable, right? That is analogous, and I'm going to use a very small example, to the question of visual clues that we put in products so you know where your hand goes or why you spend money, time, and effort to finish the bottom of something that no one will see but will only touch and will never ever think about it. But that's the whole point. <laughs> you want the success through the invisibility. Because if you touch something and it's rough or it gives you a splinter, it's an object that doesn't work. And most importantly, it isn't an interruption in the exchange of why you're physically in that space whether it's to be at home with family, to work, or somewhere in between, which is a time that we find ourselves in right now. So I think and I hope that some of the things that I'm talking to you about and some of the design references in terms of the people and the companies and the leadership and the physical objects, notwithstanding the fact that I can put something that we work on literally in front of you, there should be an enormous amount of commonality between what it is that we do because we're both in the background, right? We need to facilitate something, the exchange of information or of ideas or to create the space where people feel the comfort level associated with the exchange of that, which can be done both physically, visually, and ethereally. That is our job. And I think that various points of design, and if we go back to the point that we made earlier associated with the definition of design compared to art and craft, are embodied also in those ideas. Craft is something that is so functional. It has a physical presence. That stool is, if you think about the way in which that was first used, the leader of the tribe was the person who had that thing because it elevated them up. Everyone else sat on either a rock because the first chair was a rock or the first chair was soil. Um, and then art is this thing that we look at the form and we think and we perceive and we try to understand what the rationale of that thing is. I think that one of the big things that, uh, I don't know where we are in time, so Alistair, you have to hit me over the head as it is appropriate. Just a few more minutes, Benjamin. That's okay, good. Cool. I'm going to tell you a very interesting story about an object and one of the other jobs that I have. And when I tell this story, I still get goosebumps. So we work with physical things that are made out of molds, right? And because we make a lot of things, molds wear out. And I talked to you a little bit about the boat yard in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, that made something called the pedestal series of chairs. Some people might know it as the tulip chair. And the tooling from the 1970s was wearing out. Um, and I had to remake it. And when we remade it, it's clearly not, I was remaking this probably eight years ago. So it's 2012. And technology has changed a whole lot. And what we did was we scanned the chair, you put a series of dots on it, and you scan the chair, and then you fill in the spaces in order to understand the form. You print something, and then they can go into uh, CAD CAM work, and they can cut a piece of steel in order to be the opposite of the shape. So the first printed pieces that I saw, I'm like, guys, this thing looks like crap. There's like something totally wrong with it. 
there are these flats in it. And one of the things that was showing me that is that objects to me, I don't see the object, I see how light hits objects. That's my thing first. And that's one of the things that, how we hide and make stuff work. So I said, how did you do this? And when they explained the points, well, I said, the dots were too far apart because I have these flat things. And they said, well, yeah, it's really expensive to engineers. It's really expensive to use a lot of dots. So I said, you're gonna have to go back and put the dots closer. So they put the dots closer in the second set of models. And then what happened is I looked at the thing and I said, okay, but there's something really wrong with the object as a whole, right? What's going on? More questions, more understanding. The next discovery that I had is, is that they only made half and then pulled the symmetrical image to the other side. The way in which we have always known this chair was based on fiberglass and molded materials based on a handmade tool that was never perfect. It was not CNC'd. And in fact, that chair was asymmetrical. And the light hit it in a very different way. So as the design guy that makes the decisions associated with what do you do, because it ain't cheap to buy a piece of steel the size of a small Volkswagen, and make it into a chair, right? And the action associated with how it opens and so on and so forth. So what do you do? Do you make it perfect? Or do you make it the way in which we perceive it? And what I get goosebumps associated with it is that that chair is so incredible to me because the shape of it changes throughout the day based on how light hits it. And it was in its imperfection that it achieved the perfection of what it is. And therefore the obvious decision was not to change it, but to scan the whole object and keep it as it was originally done, flawed. But those flaws allowed a level of light that created three dimensionality rather than a slick, shiny object, which is where you lose the whole thing. So it's stories like that that you uncover and you understand that should also tell you that we maintain the history of who we are. And that history informs us and sometimes changes in terms of the way in which we make something or the technology. But we always need to maintain the essence of what our brand is, who we are, and what those objects are, and how they come together. So how's that work in timing? Are we ready for some questions? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I was just taking notes because I've got um, there's some questions coming in. So um, please, uh, please add your questions to the Q&A panel. I'm going to start with um, something that you just uh, said, though, Benjamin, as I said, I was taking notes and uh, I just wanted to, um, to kind of just dig in a little bit. I've got so many different questions that I was taking, um, so many different notes from what you were talking about. So thank you for sharing all those insights. You mentioned um, you know, success through invisibility. Like mm -hmm. you, you talked about if you touch, you know, if you hold an object and it's got a rough bottom, then you would notice it. And that's obviously bad, right? That's friction, I would call that. And in the product design world, the, the, the user experience product design world, that is friction that you don't need. And obviously the famous quote, you know, the details are not the details, they actually, they make the design, right? Like, but what, what specifically, what techniques do you have in your world, in your realm as your crafting or editing is using your words you said you're not a designer you're an editor what what mm -hmm. techniques do you have to really focus on those details and, and make sure that they are you know that the details are there and because they do make the design prototyping we prototype the hell out of every object that we make um and um i'm working on a desk for the home at the moment um with barbara oscar me and it's inspired by a desk that was done by Breuer. Um, and I, based on conversations, part of the brief is that I built a physical mock-up of an idea. It's not the desk, and when people look at it, it's a horrific thing, but it's basically a proportional study. So that's the first level of something. It's sort of a, a three-dimensional sketch that I can understand ergonomically, I can share, I can ship to the designer, I can have them understand massing and volume and so on and so forth associated with what that is. Um, then the next level of question is, is that 
for example, we have a chair coming out in uh, sometime in the middle of next year that I've been working on with Mark Newsom. Um, and the number of temporary tools that I made is so literally cutting steel in scale in order to check shots of things to make sure it works and get approvals before I cut final steel. So we spend literally millions of dollars making sure that we can build something so that it is right. And Mark is probably one of the most exacting people that I've ever worked with in terms of needing to get the details where they need to be. Um, and that is down to the, the, I will say one of my favorite models was made by a designer um, uh, who will remain nameless because this is another product that hasn't come out yet. It's got caught in stuff that was literally made out of a Paris Metro ticket by folding it. So I guess the question is, is that we work with things like that, right? That's the proverbial sketch on the cocktail napkin while you're going to have dinner by subway because there's too much traffic. To the sophisticated idea of spending, you know, $800,000 on a tool to make a cross section or a quarter section of what the back of something is, to understand things like mold flow, to understand the question of what your final textures are going to be like, to understand, um, and then building those models. And I, I guess the one huge frustration, I got a lot of, of this, not just one, there's many things about the current COVID situation, but the one on a professional basis that makes me put my nails through my hands is that I need to sit and see things, right? So. When I work with Piero Lissoni on a sofa, so upholstery is tailoring, right? Tailoring is about touch and it's about fabric and it's about how your ass hits something, quite literally. I cannot have a meeting about a sofa the way in which we're communing right now. It's just physically not possible. I think the other question that's very important um, in working with uh, a young American who lives in Switzerland right now uh, by the name of Ine Archibong, and there's a chair that we're working on um, for the cafe market. It's a, a, quite a beautiful chair. And I think that this chair ties back to the Saarinen story, and that's light. So that's the other question. The physicality of being able to see something in context is a really very important thing. Um, and I don't know, that's that's the issue for me. And I, I, hopefully that starts to get into yeah. what it is that we do. We build, build, build. Yeah. build. No, it does. And uh, I think it links to a uh, next question that comes in from the Q&A from David. He says, how, if at all, uh, does null incorporate research into its practice? And so okay. do you take those prototypes and then do research on that, like get customers in front of them, or is that? Um, the research really probably starts before that. Um, I, I will say this, we want to understand what's going on in the market, but we are not a company that will take an object and put it in front of 35 people and then let them decide what that will be. Because I think what that breeds is mediocrity based in stupidity. So I want the judgments to be based on those people who know what the heck it is that they're talking about. And these are not just aesthetic judgments. These are, so a lot of the research that we do, we talked about that chair made out of that stretched, um, we, about that stretched polymer by the name of Hytrem. Mm -hmm. If you knew many, how many hours of, ethnic, uh, of ethnographic videography of people sitting in a chair and how many bottles of scotch I probably drank watching those people, those videos. <laughs> of <laughs> people sitting in a chair. So it's really a question of, and it's not me, it's a question of bring the experts together. And that's our marketing team, our engineering team, our sales team, our CEO, um, and share that information. Because we have the conviction to understand that we know what we're doing. And we do pretty well. We've had some real clunkers. I'm not going to say that that's not the case. But as it goes, we know our convictions and we stay true to our brand based on the fact that we focus and move that stuff forward. Now, we do come back and have people look at these things and testing, but the testing associated and viewing with objects normally has much more to do with physicality to understand interaction with a product rather than is it appropriate, is it aesthetically correct, 
or do you like the color? That would never, that, that, that just doesn't enter our mind because that's not the expertise that people have that come into those groups as I understand it. And I don't mean it to be arrogant in any capacity, but at a certain point, I stand on my conviction. I think the convictions, and you mentioned, I think, principles there, right? It's like, mm -hmm. what are the principles and the convictions behind what you're making and uh -huh. staying true to that? I think that's important, right, in any design process. Uh -huh. um, and thinking, um, thinking about, like, Jay, you talked about the design process, you know, about when you're creating a space, that space being a facilitator to do what it needs to do, mm -hmm. which I found really interesting in when you were sharing. And I know we talked when we met a few weeks ago about the duality of objects and the transformability mm -hmm. of objects, but I know that we're all working from home. And there's a few questions that have come in around working from home. So in the context of working from home, you know, what practical things can we all do, do you think, you know, to make the most of the space that we have? in order to be a facilitator of great work in the environment that we have? So I guess the, the I'm a city kid. So I live in an apartment and um, I also have the opportunity to spend time on weekends outside of the city in a place that has a little bit more space. So I get to experience um, working at home in an urban environment and let's just to make it easier, call it a suburban environment. <laughs> and those are two very different kinds of things. Um, urban creatures can potentially live in a small studio um, and notwithstanding some urban people have a separate office. So these are very different questions. And I think that the space that you have um, helps you determine what it is that you can achieve. I think the most important thing is, is that you need to be able to distinguish a differentiator or make a differentiator between when I'm working and when I'm not working. And I can use myself personally to explain to you how I work in the city, um, which in the country is in fact, everything that I'm explaining to you is encapsulated in one act and that's closing a door, okay? But what I have to go through in the city is that I work on my dining room table. My dining room table is a chair, uh, excuse me, is a table designed by the designer Joe Durso the high tech guy that I mentioned earlier on casters. So it's a 48 by 96 marble top with straight faced legs on casters. When I work, um, I literally turn the desk because at that point it's a desk perpendicular to the wall and look out the window. And I've positioned the light so that when it does that, the light is to the far right centered on the desk. When I finish work and I know when I'm finished, it's not the same time. I take all the crap that's associated with work and I stick it in some little mutoe like peat bin that goes underneath in a space that's visually uncluttered. And I go back to the table and I turn it parallel to the wall with the light absolutely centered so that I can sit down and have dinner in a space that doesn't have a laptop, usually unfortunately has my phone next to it, doesn't have pens and pen pencils. I mean, literally I'm pretty old school. I was. For those of you who weren't in the green room with us earlier, one of my activities to keep myself busy was I was sharpening my colored pencils. So I have a tendency to, I, I work with some of the most incredible technology, but I still use a pencil. So the, um, and, I, and I think that that's a great combination. So that transformability is really important. The other big question that happens at home is, is that if you're a person who sits a lot, I get up all day, but there are a lot of people who work four, five, six, seven, eight hours and they're in a damn chair, which they shouldn't do. They need to get up and move around. But that means that you need a really different kind of chair. You can't sit on a stool from the kitchen. So, but office chairs have a tendency to look like they belong in the office. So what do I do about that if I need all those ergonomic features? I don't know, get a throw, put something on the back of it find another place to put it if you have room for it in a closet so it's the hell out of the space so you don't have to look at it. Um, position it in such a place that it can be out of the way, it can be against the wall, um, and it's not part of what that is. And I think that the other thing that becomes very important to me in a, in a home-based environment where people are working is that your home is your space, right? And it in some ways, is an, it's always a mix of the things that you like, right? And so if you're working, mix those things into the overall environment, 
so that they are not necessarily camouflaged, but they're a part of the space. And um, the other thing that if you have the advantage of this, one of the things that I like to do when I work that makes it a lot easier to work from home, and this is another light issue for me, is I like to work in different rooms. So sometimes I work at that table slash desk that I move around. But you know, in the morning when the Eastern sun is coming up, I really like to read my first communications that I get. I start my day early at five because I deal with Europe. Those are my first calls. But I like that in the morning to sit there in a lounge chair and it's much more relaxed. I'm starting my day, I can have my coffee. Um, sometimes in this eating, uh, uh, working from home thing, I'm still working at seven o'clock and I'm hungry and I want to cook dinner at the same time. Well, that's my standing area, right? So if I want to work in a standing position, I go to my kitchen counter and I'm peeling string beans or asparagus, or whatever it is that I'm doing while I'm doing this or having a conversation or um, going through stuff. So use different parts of the house. I think that that's a very important part. Of, you got it. Everyone's got a counter in the kitchen. Use it, right? Yeah. You know? And when you're in the office, you don't sit, you go different places. So find that balance and let the, let the space represent you. Mm, that's great. Thank you. And um, like linking to space, there's a question that's coming from John. Uh, uh, and I know we talked about this briefly a few weeks ago. Like, how do you think about furniture or furniture arrangement in an office space or at home? But how can that influence conversations with multiple people to be you know, potentially more inclusive or like to make better use of the space and the people that you have in there? How do you, th how do you think about that? Well, I guess the, if, if um, I'll take this from two different directions. So um, let's talk about an urban environment or even a suburban environment um, associated with a, a huge step that's taken place sometime probably in the late 70s, early 80s. Up to that time, there was this Victorian idea of service. And the house, particularly the kitchen, was always extracted from the overall space and was this thing that was walled in and contained away. And then there was a specific place to eat and there was a specific place to do all of the various things. Um, and then starting in the 70s, possibly driven by things like hospitality, one of the first places that I think about this is a restaurant by the name of America in New York City. It was the first restaurant that I ever experienced in the 70s. It was a 53,000 square foot restaurant. It was gigantic. And you could have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at three o'clock in the morning before you went to an after hours club. So, the, um, <laughs> so I guess the question is, there's this breakdown of a space and loft living and the understanding of, you know what, these big horizons are also possible in a home and apartments, and even basic construction of residential units in a suburban sense became, I guess the first term was the great room or the opportunity for people to come together around an activity which was either eating or exchange of information or working, because to me, those three things are absolutely the same, which is why I worked with a guy by the name of David Rockwell, which is about hospitality and theater. How do you bring those things into furniture and how do you bring people together and how do you physically stage a person? Remember, I started out the conversation by saying that Florence Knoll built sub-architecture to create a space within a space. That's the answer to this question. The answer to the question is, is that how do we put together and arrange objects and find objects in their neutrality or in their figurative sense that help create an appropriate space in terms of its horizontal and its vertical. Because at the end of the day, the only thing that I ever manipulate is this and that. That's it. I change the height of stuff. And when I work on a space, I change the verticality. I can change color. I have fenestration. I have all of those things. But in essence, it's really about how do I want people to feel and work. If I build gyp walls, right, there's an enclosure sense of privacy and I can have more formal base needs. But if I knock all of that stuff down, if I think of your new facility uh, that was done by um, Mark and Sharon, right? And the wonderful way in which they kept the corridor and the circulation in that, that building is not so easy. Um, and then the idea of the screen through textile and so on and so forth. 
there's an incredible level of intimacy created in those spaces that allows for an individual to focus, a group to work together, and then congregation of larger things. And I think that architecturally and in the interior spaces, the question can be answered by thinking about how Mark and Sharon really thought through those problems. And I hope that it's been successful for all of you. Because um, I can, I look at that project as something that's great um, to be able to create space that works for people. Perfect. Yeah, the, the new office is a wonderful space. Um, I, uh, I, linking to that, I mean, it's I, I think it's interesting. You talked about space and different like heights and how it was used. Like some Sanjeev has asked a question, which uh, like he's curious to understand the process. Is it design? that leads to materials that you use? Or is it inverse? Do you look at materials and cost of manufacturing? Because you mentioned engaging in engineering and sales. So is it materials and cost of manufacturing that then leads to design? Like how do you, how do you figure out that process? Depends on the project, but it is a circle. I think that mm -hmm. at the beginning, um, I'll be very direct here. Some projects are completely led by marketing. Marketing says, Company A has this widget. I don't have it. It's $80 bajillion in sales and we'll have to shoot ourselves in the head unless we have it. So we look at it and we come up with a way to resolve that problem. Second one is design says, this is a very important idea. I want to explore it. I'm not even going to talk to marketing. <laughs> I want to, that's the Rem Cool House object, right? Um, and then the majority of things are a combination of conversation that takes place. Um, and so the, or very early on in the process, there's an engineer involved, there's a planner. So uh, we work, we have a specific person who understands how to plan and puts those objects in plan so we understand those relationships. They're interacting with the designer um, and the designer is in some ways also talking to, either comes to us with the material or we push back and think about material choice and so on and so forth. And we don't limit ourselves to only things that we physically make. I mean, we have a supply chain that's international in scale. It's everywhere. Um, and um, which is a very important part of what it is that we do. And um, it is a supply chain that makes a hundred or it's a supply chain that makes millions of something. And I think that that's one of the blessed things about Nihon is that we have that balance and you'd be surprised how often the 10 of something can form the million of something in a way that is, you know, really kind of exciting in some ways. That's awesome. And then we've only got a couple more minutes left. I want to, um, uh, can you like maybe really quickly, like I'll take this one, uh, someone anonymous has said, can you tell me about your favorite, um, home office piece of furniture like why so wh why do you love it so much um my favorite piece of home office furniture i think it really is my table mm. um why uh, first of all the fact that a table moves to me is just an amazing thing right <laughs> that's a that's a that's a great big thing i also think that i'm really fortunate enough to have an exquisite piece of stone. And uh, I think that one of the ways to work best is to fidget and find sometimes distraction is not a bad thing while trying to solve a problem. One of my favorite activities while working is sometimes to see a figure in the pattern of stone. So I see a cloud or I see a man or I see two cats or, and I see different things all the time. Um, and I also think that um, this table for me is it grounds me because it's this heavy thing. Um, and it's a material question, it's a natural material. Um, and that's kind of, an, and it's somewhat reflective and it is um, enigmatic because it's constantly changing. And mm. I, the other thing about it is, is that it's 48 by 96 and it lets me spread out. So the other thing that is a good thing it, for me is that I can move around the table because I'm usually the only person working at it and do different things in different places. So that big horizontal made out of, in this particular case, a very luxurious material. Um, I will also cite another table that is a very important table to me that I worked on in a previous life um, that was designed by Jean Nouvelle um, for the company Unifor, which was called the Less Table. 
It was done for the Cartier Foundation in Paris. And basically, out of sheet steel, um, he was able to work with us to design a table that was four millimeters in thickness at the edge. And there was a bent, and it was bent metal, had a chamfer. But when you viewed that table, it looked like this incredibly thin plane of steel. And it had a roof-like construction. So the table could be 240 centimeters long and have no bow. So I think that sometimes that magic associated with how do you create something that visually is just, I mean, the beauty of a cantilever is just so exciting. So it's those moments associated with furniture and architecture for me, whether they're at home in the office, that are, you know, I can feel the hair raising on my, mm -hmm. on my arms at the moment. Those are exciting things to me. Um, and um, that's how I choose. It's what it is that it does and how it does it and how it's fascinating that makes these things your favorite. That's perfect. And uh, so thank you. Like we're at pretty much time. So thank you, Benjamin, for sharing those insights. It was wonderful to hear you talk about, you know, so many different varied uh, topics in there and like thinking about the details the details really make the design and how incredibly important they are thinking about i loved your point about are we editing or are we actually designing like what's important there and then staying true to your convictions as you think about heritage and trying to innovate but staying true to your your uh your convictions and then the practicality around the transform transformability of objects in space as you think about just turning your table at home as you're working from home to create to create a different type of space that, le that represents you, but has a different function. Um, and then, you know, interestingly in the UX design world, you talked about cross-functional collaboration between engineering, sales, marketing, incredibly relevant to us and to how we work. And so thank you for sharing all of those wonderful lessons, Benjamin. I, uh, I and the rest of the audience truly appreciate it. And uh, wherever you are in the world, stay safe and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. I just want to say one thing. Okay. I want to thank all of you for your product because it is a very large part of how I can move and receive information and it's a godsend. So thanks thank very you. much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Well, everyone stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thanks Benjamin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.